Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Community Matters. Today, I am joined by my dear, dear friend, Beatrice Contelmo, and we're going to co-host this show. Uh, we have just, we are commemorating 100 years since the end of World War I. And I think that in, let's take a, we're going to take a step back, I think, and look at the last 100 years that have brought us up to this point. For those of you that know, I hope you do know, that Dante wrote a poem many hundreds of years ago. And, and in it, he takes a journey into hell. And there's several rings as he descends into hell. And there is one ring where he says that fraud is worse than violence. And what does that mean? Why is fraud worse than violence? Because fraud always comes before violence. You always have to tell people some crap. And, in, and this is what our governments have been doing to us. And in the 20th century, 177 million people were killed because of governments in the 20th century. Governments use fraud against their own people to get them to support wars. So there. Right. That's where, and, and he goes on to say that in these rings, you find politicians and government officials and what have you are all in these rings because not across the country, across the world. So, Beatrice, let's start with the Spanish Civil War right. 19, in 1936. Before we do, I want to thank you for being here co-hosting this show today of Community Matters. I want to thank all of the men and women uh, and their families, um, whether they are heterosexual or from the LGBTQIA community, for their service to this nation and abroad. Uh, because uh, it's quite remarkable what uh, you know they do. And uh, let's talk about fraud. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and you know, my great 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 grandfather was. Civil War General, Confederate Civil War General, John Bell Hood. And there has not been a generation in my family since then that has not been in the military. Mm -hmm. So we come from a long line. In fact, I don't remember a time when I didn't have an ID card when I wasn't someone else's dependent. Mm -hmm. I, they changed that so you're no longer a dependent. Right. But Nonetheless, it's the same thing. So he paved the way not only for all the members of your family to uh, feel inspired to join the military, but uh, the identity in your family connected with the uh, military well, is very strong. It is, except, of course. From a place that, of pride, too. I except assume. that he was a slaveholder. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Uh, that's one aspect of deceit, uh, which, by the way, yes. in Dante's, uh, I think, yeah, the word, I think, got translated into English as fraud, but really, I think what it meant with the Dante Alighieri's yes. Inferno is that actually deceit Feet. comes before violence. It is deceit. Yes. Yes. And fraud. When, so fraud when is part of the deceit. Yes. Deceit. Yes. Uh, yeah, it is yeah. the deceit yeah. that they um, sell this war. Mm -hmm. And that you've got to go to war, yeah. Right. And we're still yeah. doing it, 2018. Yes. You know, like, look here, we are at war, and the biggest war is for war for peace. When are we going to get to that point where we don't sell uh, the idea that we need to be at war and instead work more towards um, diplomacy and peace building and peacekeeping? Does well, it have to be war? Do we well, have you know to be? That at Christmas time, I don't know why we only do it at Christmas. We sing, 
let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. So if we sang that every day, if we really internalized it every day, that peace begins with me, mm -hmm. then we, because as long as peace begins with me, we have to be conscious of what we're saying and is that fraud or deceit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and is it true, you know, and uh, I think part of peace too, like when nations decide to go to war to um, the justifications, which I think is the part of the deceit, Deep. you know, it's so hard when you think about Syria, for example, and what's happened with the people of Yemen. Was it really uh, necessary that we uh, would go there the way we went? Uh, and uh, what are we doing still? And how are the people, are they better off since we started the war? Are they worse off? Uh, and well, if we look at now, of course, World War II, um, because of the, the Nazis' um, final decision to, to do away with the Jews and the gypsies and the gays and anybody else that wasn't pure Aryan, I think then we understood, we thought we had, we knew who the enemy was, but most of the time, that, that, we don't know yeah. who the enemy is. And the parameters were very different. Mm -hmm. I think World War II was quite justified, even though the sacrifices were so great. But, you know, we were fighting for uh, freedom, democracy, and justice, and dignity, and human rights, which, you know, were all stripped away yes. in that period. Well, and we, we, we understood, as a child growing up during the war, we understood exactly what... Now, I wasn't quite so sure about Japan, but we were really mm -hmm. sure about... Germany. Germany, yeah. about Europe. Right. And, and uh, there was this feeling, it wasn't said out loud, except mm -hmm. people, that if we did not defeat Hitler, who was killing the Jews and the gypsies and the gays uh, okay. and all of those people that didn't, the more pure Aryan, yeah. that we were next. And yeah. if we didn't defeat him, we were yeah. next. And that uh, was what, what I was taught as a little girl, yeah. and this is why we are right. fighting. That yeah. is why we are in this war. Yeah. And that, you know, um, you have what you described, but there was also a fight uh, for the end of nationalism and the uh, Nazi regime, which, you know, has no room for democracy, discourse, it's all censor, it's all very militant, a lot of power. It's a different role of military, where the, the military is used to instill fear and to uh, sustain the system, uh, you know, and the order, you know, through abusive measures, and uh, you know that was very necessary to fight against because this was spreading all over. Oh uh, yeah, so the fear was real. It was real. Yeah, and it is continuing <laughs> yes. in 2018 because, to be real. Yeah, because, because uh, like I said, in in the Spanish Civil War, yes, 1936 was the first time that the word fascist, which is comes from Italy, as you know. To control, yeah. It was to control. And that was the first time that it was really public. Um, and when we, of course, read about it, mm -hmm. then it's spread all over Europe. Fascism, it was had different names in different countries, of course. Mm -hmm. But here we are today with nationalism, and uh, for those that were watching, Macron, the prime minister of France. France, made it clear about nationalism. And I don't think that our president understood, or maybe he did understand, maybe he does know what nationalism mm -hmm. is. Well, I think that uh, um, it's nice to have uh, world leaders uh, in the same place, talking about, and um, we need to 
uh, criticize and question that nationalist rhetoric that's being used here in the United States and in other countries too, because like Italy right now is going through the same thing, uh, Philippines, uh, North Korea, Brazil, Brazil. We just elected a man who is openly um, outright, you know, um, supporter. And with that, also that culture of uh, teaching nationalism in, in very similar ways that people uh, during the 30s and 40s in Germany were indoctrinated too, where, you know, like in America, is make American great again. What that means is not America first, it's white people first. first. It is, and we all understand yeah. that is what he is saying, and it is the same as it was. Exactly. So even all of yeah. those years. So the 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 uh, techniques used also to uh, start slowly implement this regime, which to me is more of a uh, it's almost a hybrid between fascism and and the Nazi regime because. There are a lot of similarities with both regimes. And what I see are the similarities is that they're both heavily militarized under uh, control through force, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's used. Uh, censorship is right quite there on top because you cannot have dissent and uh, speak out against this regime so uh, for it to work. So you have to, to get rid of. Yes. You have to get rid of it, and you have to silence uh, the voices of people, of the press, who are dealing oh, yes. with that, That's, right? Oh, yes. uh, but I think where the difference is that both, both regimes uh, were based on nationalism, but like in Italy, uh, it, 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 the shape that it took with nationalism was more like economy and the politics where you, you support Italy first and only before you start thinking of, you know, your colleagues from other countries. In Germany, I think nationalism took that, that you know, shape, but further, which is the part of identity, where the Aryan identity of chosen, you know, a prime of Germany. Well, and then, so that gives the excuse to, you know, not include any of the minorities. Yes. And that, so that's why the Jewish were persecuted, why the gypsies, why people from uh, Slavic countries were also persecuted, the gays were persecuted. Oh, yes. Because so, they didn't fit that role. They didn't and, fit the role. And, but in Weimar, Berlin, before, you know, during the, the Depression, right after World War One. And Hitler blamed the Jews for the Depression. Mm -hmm. You know, if it wasn't for them, kind of thing. You know, and then people were suffering. Mm -hmm. So he had to have a scapegoat, and, and that right. was it. Yeah. And the gays were the entertainers, and in the and the artists, and in that art, and they had a voice and a they platform had a voice. and a different narrative. Yes, to share. and that's yeah. how they were telling the rest of this is what's coming. Mm -hmm. So he had to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's also, you know, this um, a connection with the uh, uh, moralist, uh, you know, narrative that comes a lot from that religion aspect of it. So being gay then and now does not fit the norm uh, of morality. I think in most countries there are no progressive and get it differently and have that separation. So you also have you know, that additional layer, you know, to consider. But I find this very interesting that we're talking about this, because I know we're talking about 100 years. I think we can go back and forth. In 2018, if we look at the United States uh, in the first year of Trump administration, we had, you know, big impact and threats uh, for LGBTQIA laws, especially against the transgendered individuals and the transgendered individuals in the military. So that's always been, you know, like one point that they're always saying it. So that's like it's abnormal and that we can't include, yes. and we can't accept immigrants, you know. Okay. Well, now we need to take a break. Okay. Well, We've got 60 seconds. And okay. then, yeah, let's talk about immigrants yeah. and what that means. 
Yeah. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Community Matters, and Beatrice and I are reliving the 20th century. <laughs> Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. I think there is good, bad, and ugly over it. <laughs> I'm, I'm 46 years old, and I go, okay, I don't have much uh, of the context of, like, well, perhaps you might have lived, you know, like, because you saw these regimes coming and falling and now resurrecting in some <laughs> places. I, I felt, I, I experienced uh, some uh, um, aspects of it. Like, for example, in Brazil, like, I you, was... I was going to say, yeah. That, yeah, coming as an indigenous person from yeah. Brazil, you... So, uh, it's very interesting, because I, I was, so uh, I'm a Brazilian national, also I'm an Italian national, by default, because my grandparents were from Italy, but my grandparents, uh, you know, and other family members uh, of Italy moved to Brazil during the fascist movement, because... To get away from Mussolini, yeah. They did not want to deal with this, and uh, they... Back then, there was no United Nations. There was no uh, refugees resettlement programs. And uh, the part of having dissent against an authoritarian, you know, government like my grandparents had and all the family members had, there was like automatic persecution and death. You can't survive in this kind of situation. So I had this background, you know, from like my upbringing. But until the age of 12, I was raised in a, a military dictatorship regime in Brazil. So I was uh, tailored, I was groomed, you know, to grow up to not speak up. Well, that did not work, because now I speak up the wall, but, uh, the, the, you know, we had sense like, you know, walls have ears, meaning you have to really watch out what you're going to say and where, because the military will come, and uh, they will beat the crap out of people, send them to jail, torture them, and kill them. And uh, and that was for adults, and uh, they were, you know, just doing things that you and I do that we take for granted as, like, democratic society that you can be an advocate for democracy <laughs> and that you can do uh, social justice and political discourse and dissent against the government when they mess up i can't do that under these regimes no. you know i no. can't do it can't so do. i had a little taste of that but then i had the taste of the birth of democracy in brazil which was fabulous because i actually saw uh, the uh, rough drafts of brazilian constitution being written and introduced and passed and that was just like amazing for a teenager to uh, who's also learning about different governments you know but before it was hidden like under military dictatorship you only follow and salute and honor that regime you know, if you teach anything different, well, you know, then you're supporting, you know, you're communist, you are supporting, you know, you're the enemy. You're the enemy, You're yes. the enemy, but I just so happen to have had that exposure growing up at home because of where my family came from. Uh, but then, you know, when Brazil became democracy, well, then you really have uh, an opportunity to really have it in the open. And then moving to the United States 25 years ago, where it's been like the vacuum of democracy, where most countries in the world would mirror themselves, you know, to become a democracy. And now we're dealing with what we're dealing with, uh, both here in the United States, 
where democracy is really at stake and under threat. And in Brazil, after, 20, after 31 years of being a democratic regime, 55% of voters in Brazil elected a president who is going to reinstate a military dictatorship. And it's devastating, because you can see the parallels between what's happening in the United States um, with uh, talks about changing legislation that impacts uh, environment, indigenous people, and immigrants. We're going to deal with the same shit in Brazil. I'm sorry to say it the way it is, but that's, that's the word, exactly because it. it is. It is. And, uh, and so, and if you move back and you look at what uh, fascism regime did and what Nazi regime did uh, in Germany, it's the same thing. So we're back in the same we're back loop. In, back in the same loop, <laughs> yes. And, and in fact, now, of course, the Americans kind of pretend like none of this happened, but this eugenics, what Hitler did was created in America, mm -hmm. funded in America. And he thought, oh, well, I can get rid of people, too. America even had what they called the ugly laws. And they were getting rid of people that were handicapped. Uh, they called them, it was the scientific rationale that drove killer doctors at Auschwitz to um, create, to copy what was then going on with America. What began as an organized campaign at the start of the 20th century was financed by Andrew Carnegie, the Rockefellers, and the Hermans. And that was the eugenics movement. So anybody, it didn't matter the race, it, but anybody that wasn't perfect, they forced uh, sterilization, put them in institutions and mm -hmm. what have you, just right. get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Anybody yeah. that wasn't perfect. Right. And eugenics, I think, in 2018 in the United States uh, has a different uh, shape. You know, if you think about uh, the gun crisis that we have in the United States and who it primarily impacts, so if you think about African Americans and minorities, you know, they are the ones who are always shot at, and uh, the poor communities are the ones that are always, you know, uh, at risk. If you think about uh, indigenous people, how many indigenous reservations have been completely destroyed, destroyed. and uh, reorganized, not with the intent to empower, but to take the very little that they had from 40, 50 years ago? how much of the resources are not uh, um, shared, you know, to continue to support and empower them. So you look at the prevalence of illness and uh, uh, substance abuse and poverty in Native uh, American, you know, uh, tribes. It's across the nation, including in, the, in Hawaii. Uh, yes. uh, if you think about what we don't do in terms of honoring and revival of uh, and pride of Native American uh, heritage, language, uh, you know, it's, if people don't speak both languages and they're not exposed to it and learn it, it's one of the quickest ways to kill a culture is to get, rid of, get rid of the language, because you get rid of, of, of the history, the traditions that's passed orally. Most, most Amer like indigenous cultures, they it's are storytellers. Oral, yes. It's oral traditions. And so you kill that, you kill a lot. They don't even, you can't even, yeah. your dream in the conqueror's language. Exactly, you know, yeah. yeah. So, so you have that. So, you know, I mean, it's so hard. And like, when you talk about immigration, Okay, so now we are against, uh, you know, Central American and, and South American immigrants, Latinos, and, uh, you know, uh, immigrants, they're refugees, or even that come from Africa, are from shithole countries. We don't want them here. So the immigrants that we are aspiring to have are the Northern European ones, the white ones that we're talking, mm -hmm. you know, the people who already are educated in this country, and, and, and this, the divide. This Yes, and in now, the largest group of immigrants are Asian. But so it's the president is looking at 
these brown people from Honduras, and it was the Americans that screwed up Honduras. Exactly. Honduras was doing fine until yeah. the drug uh, and all of the transferring and it happened. Yes. Yeah. So there is a lot of uh, that and and uh, re reparation that needs to occur. I think from the place of the United States with regards to Central and South American countries, but it's also a moral obligation. I think as a first world nation. Uh, to, you know, respect human rights. I mean, coming to the United States to require or to request asylum, it's not a crime. The crime is to prevent people from, uh, you know, doing this and to label them as being, uh, you know, thieves and dirty people and unworthy people. These are people who, like, maybe 100 years ago, who came on the ships of, of the United States, you know, as Irish, uh, Polish, Italians, uh, were welcomed. They did not have a wall, and they did not have the military coming, you know, to say, you cannot come here. There was not an immigration process that has so many difficulties like we are having now in 2018, you know, what? for the United States, and across the globe, too, because we're course, not the only yes, ones. No, yeah, and it's really... Um, I found this article. Take a look. That is written by Scott Simon, who is, uh, for our audience that may not know who Scott Simon is, and he is one of the producers of uh, PBS. And he talks in this article about the president and his praise of strong men. And so, while well, I'm not going to read the article, mm -hmm. but let me tell you, he uh, likes, let me read this, of course, is Putin, mm -hmm. the president of the Philippines, mm -hmm. the president of China, and uh, Kim Jong-un, North, North Korea, Korea. Yep. and uh, and it goes on and on and on of all of the crown prince. Mm -hmm. From Egypt, yep. yeah. Yes. And uh, all I call of him B.S. Salah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'll never go to Egypt, so the, the, yeah, what, I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> and Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Yeah. All of those people, all of those dictators, and now Brazil. At Brazil, yes. And we're doing the same thing in Brazil. So uh, one of the things uh, that uh, Bolsonaro have said in his uh, campaign, as he was trying to run for president, was that, uh, well, we're going to use uh, military to bring back order into the country. So Brazil has some issues with violence. It has a lot to do with poverty. It has a lot to do with uh, drugs. It has a lot to do with disparities. But the way to resolve it is like let's you know arm people and have heavy military you know army to be on the streets. And one of the things they said is like, well, in the dictatorship times, the problem was not torture. The problem is that we didn't kill enough people. So <laughs> part of his discourse in 2018 was, well, we're going to you know kill a lot of people, maybe 30, 40,000 people. Uh, the indigenous people of Brazil, he already have said very clearly, either they adapt to the new order or they will, disappear. it's eugenics, they'll disappear. So Amazon is about to be, um, you know, open for grabs. So more logging industry, natural Get resource off. and all of that. And so we are seeing a very similar discourses by these leaders, but to wrap it up, I think the part of the deceit, they pick uh, the brain of the people and they try to convince them that this is not the way it was, but it is, and it's actually worse. It is. And so we're back to Dante. Mm -hmm. It was right. He is right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oops. But I'm hopeful, because for every system that falls, the people organize, I and think that we system saw, breaks. I think with this election that we saw a change. Exactly. And it feels good. And that's what uh, sustains me, I think, you know, as a, as, as a woman and as an adult, uh, is that, 
there are spaces for changes and we need to continue to fight that. And so people know your history, be educated, because if you don't know your history, it keeps repeating itself. And uh, we gotta go. We gotta go. So that's all we had. <laughs> Aloha. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time. Bye.